I'm going to start with one that was um, uh, asked a little earlier, and this one's for you, Nicole. Um, Carl asked, it, it appears that there's a link to soil temperature and soil arthropod activity. Do you have a, a comment on that? I mean, I would agree with that for sure. I think it would be like any other um, climate change for any other organism. But um, I would say that, that would determine, like, the species that the soil can hold because it's like if, if you're in Nebraska and you're having such significant soil temperature changes, obviously they're going to have to be hardy enough to deal with that. But if it's down in Hawaii, they probably have a lot smaller range of temperatures that they can handle. So I would definitely say that, that will that would change which species you would be seeing. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Um, and I think there's another one here that is probably for you. It says, what does the 46,000 um, per hectare of manure convert to in gallons per acre, and were different rates compared? Was that the rate that you had put on? I think it's like 5,000 gallons per acre. I could, I could figure that out for you real quick, but... Um, why did we do it that way? Is that the second part of that question? It says, uh, were different rates compared? No, because that's, um, that's kind of an industry standard for like a commercial applicator, so that's just the way that we did it for that reason. Okay. Um, and then on your graph, you mentioned something about um, soil disturbance potentially having an impact on some of those upper level or, or the ones that are near, more near the surface. Um, but then, you know, you saw them regroup and come back. Was that the, the result of the manure application providing a pretty good source of food for them, or uh, how quickly did you see some of that, those populations rebound? I, I saw it was on your graph, but I didn't write it down. Um, disturbance is my best guess for why they ended up depleting like that only in the injection plots since that's kind of the area of the soil that you would find them in. But yeah, I would definitely say that they kind of bounce back after that because other than that, they, I mean, for the injection plots, everything else kind of increased. So I would say that the settling of the soil then after time and the increase of the like characteristics that they would need in the soil, I would definitely say that that's what contributed to bringing that back up, which it did, yeah. It, it did after a couple months. A couple months. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I have one um, for you, uh, Mike. It's, so if the soil microorganisms are in balance with the manure food, odor should be minimal. Do you have a comment on that? Well, basically that's, that's what's happening, yeah. If you have the microbes and it's balanced with your carbon and nitrogen ratio, you shouldn't have any odors. And we are looking at that very, uh, through research now to prove it out. Also moisture, you know, because the pan is so dry. And then um, a follow-up to that was that the system, the IDLS system sounds like a, a form of composting. Would you say that that's what's going on in there? I know during our practice session you used the word fermentation a fair bit too, but could you comment on that? Yeah, it is, it is a form of composting because basically the pigs are on a, an aerobic compost pile that's been inoculated with the microorganisms. And then uh, one question was what happens to the, the nitrogen and phosphorus that's excreted? And the, um, Rick asked, I assume the nitrogen is released into the atmosphere, and do we know in what form it's released? Okay, we did the older studies, and we knew that there was not much uh, ammonia being produced, but we have a researcher that's looking at the greenhouse gases in these in these uh, systems now to try to determine whether it's going to produce more or less greenhouse gas than traditional farming. So, yeah, right that with that said, we're still doing the research on that. Okay, and then the phosphorus. Um, what happens to the phosphorus in the in the system? Basically, it's being used by the microbes, and because uh, we have a lot of fungi in there, so we don't we don't see very much phosphorus being generated in the system. 
I think in our practice session you said the, the phosphorus pretty much stays there as long as that pack stays there, but then if it is ever removed, whether the piggery closes down or whatnot, it, it's still an appropriate material for land application. Have you been involved in that? Oh, yes. We, uh, there's farms that are actually using it on their farm. Uh, they use it as a compost tea that they use for spraying. So it can be used, and we have no regulation by the EPA or Department of Health for not using it on our facilities. Okay. And then another person asked if this has been tried with poultry barns. It would seem like a concept that might be useful in areas where manure nutrients are beginning to exceed the, the needs of the crops in the area. Have you seen, seen it used with poultry? Yes, in Korea they use it with poultry, but uh, the facility that is being built in Pakistan is poultry, and I got one in California that's going doing some broilers. Um, he's going to probably be doing 800 birds a week, and he's using the system right now. He just broke ground outside of San Francisco, so it can be used on poultry. Okay. I'm going to throw in here your way, Mario. I see you answered it um, in the chat box, but I'm going to bring it up here anyway. And it, it mentioned that uh, mint residues are have been shown to be a very good carbon source. Have you used that, or have you have you looked at that with the project that you did? Uh, no, our project uh, focused uh, shoots on the grape uh, vine prunings. And I heard that, yeah, the mint um, residues also are good a uh, carbon source um, but um, you know I well I never have the opportunity to work with that on the Magic Valley at least and in southern Idaho the meat producers are not so close from the dairy there is an area in the Treasure Valley and that there are some dairy and meat producers so they can also mix their, their uh, waste lines uh, if necessary. But no, I never experiment with that. Okay. Now are you, um, did you do this on commercial farms or was this from research farms? No, well, something interesting, and I should have mentioned that on the presentation, all this was done on commercial farms. So I was on farm uh, composting on, on operating commercial farms. Uh, so it has its challenges. <laughs> Uh, and it, it was fun to do. It was fun, fun to do. Do you think it's something that these farms will continue to try and do? Uh, well, unfortunately, unfortunate, unfortunately, the the grape farm went out of business for other for personal reasons. <laughs> uh, so I I don't think the well, they can't continue, but the dairy farm, I, I don't know if they want to pick up something of these with other sources of carbon, you know. Mm -hmm. We need to get people drinking more wine out there so those grape farms aren't going out of business, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. No, but this one, I mean, the, the grape industry is doing very well here in Idaho on the wine. And in this case, this farmer did uh, table um, grapes. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, okay. But our, our grape industry is doing great in Idaho. So this, this offers an alternative to the annual burning that actually is the most used method for disposing of the pruning. Mm -hmm. yeah, and the burning is, um, has been an issue in your part of the world because of the contributions to the particulates. Is that correct? The yes. Clear? Yes. Mm -hmm. And usually also, you know, many of the wineries or, or t uh, great, um, table grade producers are promoting, you know, their sustainability and, and it's kind of a sore eye uh, when they burn <laughs> such amount of carbon. Um, so if, if, and also the local air quality is impacted with that burning too, yeah, definitely. Okay. And I have one here I'm going to um, send back here to Mike. Has the IDLS been used with hoop housing for pigs? Yeah, that's that's what's been happening out in Philadelphia. We use we converting all those dry litters over there to IDLS. Interesting. And then I have one here for you, Nicole. Um, 
Is the arthropod numbers used in any current soil health test messages, such as the Haney test or the Cornell test? Are you aware of any of that? Unfortunately, I do not know for sure. You mean just in comparison to other soil health indicators? Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is kind of preliminary still. We still have a lot of data collection, but I, I do not know of this being compared to those at this time. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. And then, Mario, I had a question for you on the, the greenhouse trial. If you're going to take a closer look at some of that, were you going to look at trying to repeat the entire composting demonstration, or did you just keep some of the compost from this demonstration and use that again, or...? Yeah, no, I just have some compost from, from that trial, so I'm going to try to replicate that on the greenhouse with the compost I, I have. So if there is any biological activity that created that difference that died, died out, you know, since I, I took the samples, well, um, we're going to discover that, you know. Uh, yeah. But, yeah, no, I, it's not that I'm going to do the whole composting again. It's just trying on samples I kept from the trial. I was just curious if you would get the same, you know, same or similar results um, doing that again. All right, if anyone has any questions, this would be the time to quickly throw them up. But in the meantime, I'm going to thank our speakers. Um, I really appreciate all of you not only doing the poster, but then preparing the slides for today. Um, I really enjoyed this. I, I thought it was a fascinating topic and um, greatly appreciate all of you taking the time, and thank you to our audience for joining us today.